Hi, I'm Mena Malik Hussain and this is The Coffee Table and me in my power sleeves welcome you to another wonderful show. <laughs> I'm really excited because today we're going to be talking about animal rescue and animal shelters here in Pakistan and the wonderful and trying to highlight some of the wonderful work that two stalwart young ladies have been doing for animal welfare here in Pakistan and this is a sort of conversation that we, it's, it's both complex and simple at the same time and I'm really excited to be sort of delving into both of those things today on the show. We are so excited to be welcoming Aisha Chundigar all the way from Karachi over the internet. <laughs> Aisha is the founder of the ACF Animal Rescue, which is the first and largest rescue service and shelter in Pakistan. It was set up in 2013 and has been doing such important and fantastic work in Karachi for animal welfare. We are also really, really excited to be welcoming Hena Muzaffar Shah, here in Lahore. She is an animal rescuer and activist. She's been running her own private shelter for the past seven years. And she is also the brains and beauty behind Faltu Sipaltu, which is an initiative aimed to educate and sensitize the public to animal rights. Welcome to the show, ladies. <laughs> Excitement all around. So Aisha, tell me, um, tell me a little bit about your journey to setting up ACF and I know that it began in 2013 but I don't think that anybody who works with animal rights um, just sort of magically woke up to it. I think that most people who are involved in this have loved animals since they were little and then at some point decided that something concrete needed to be done to protect them. So tell me a little bit about the ACF journey. Okay well first thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I was uh, just telling you I might be a little low right now because I have two frozen shoulders and I have been working in the sun for like the last two days and I'm a little exhausted. So I apologize if I come across a little exhausted and dead right now. However, um, yes, yeah, so I was a 24 uh, when ACF started and I had just moved back from England. So I was a journalist over there. And uh, again, I was doing humanitarian documentaries essentially. And then I came back and I also became a therapist for humans while I was <laughs> training and doing that yeah. and doing journalism. And I had like four other jobs because I had to make money. And then I set this up. But, um, you know, yeah, I've always loved animals. I've always had animals. I've always rescued animals, like as much as you could as a kid. But there was yeah. no really, you know, like no, no concept over here. So I think for me, it was, um, honestly, it was less about animals. Hmm. Uh, and it was more about like ACF's vision, which is in our articles of association and legally whatever I put out there to register and make this organization was more about helping all of those neglected and ignored segments of society hmm. that no one looks at. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the personal journey, obviously, because, you know, you only feel that kind of empathy when maybe you've gone through something yeah. similar. And um, I think I'm, I'm, I've always been one for the underdog, be it human or animal. So it was mm -hmm. never, for me, it, it was not about this is just animals. Like if yeah. you look at our vision for ACF, it was about any segment. That yes. is. And so as a therapist, I worked with acid burn survivors. Mm -hmm. I set up the first therapy center for them. I work with orphans. I work with kids who've been through drug addiction and sexual yeah. abuse. So uh, for me, it was all segments. Yeah, and it just right. happened to... Animals happen to gain the most momentum. Mm -hmm. And I started with animals because I was like, no one's doing anything for them. Yeah. And uh, everyone, you know, told me I was crazy and that this is obviously not going to work. And, you know, like one thing that really bothered me as a kid, for example, when I would ask a teacher or an adult, uh, you know, this donkey, like he's obviously looking really sad yeah. and there's something not okay and he's dragging all this heavy weight. Mm -hmm. And the answer I would get is, well, they're used to it. Yeah. I used to be like, no one is used to suffering. No, no one likes it. No one is used no. to it. So that's a very yeah. easy cop-out, which yes. I don't believe in cop-outs. I don't believe yeah. in complaining, whining, cop-out. I think if something... So for me, it was about if you're seeing suffering, mm. any kind of suffering, I don't believe suffering should exist to a certain degree if we can actually make sure that it doesn't. Because if we continue to make it exist we are part of the problem right. rather than the solution. And this whole idea that, oh, well, they're used to it. No one is used to suffering. No, no one is used to constantly being beaten or being abused. Yep. And if they get used to it, that's not a good thing. That means we have done something wrong in society, yep. that we have, we've made suffering a norm. So for me, it was more a very philosophical reason. 
that got me here. And yes, I when I, I moved back from England uh, because I was severely uh, depressed because I was I had a great job over there. I was getting a wonderful job as a reporter for a big channel and um, I was getting a few modeling gigs and a whole bunch of things. I was like on my game over there. Yeah. And then I sort of hit this 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 fork in the road mm. where I was like, look, um, have a choice. Either I go do the glamorous stuff, yeah. which, you know, still humanitarian issues or whatever, mm. or I go back and I do something insane and, you know, um, <laughs> give it a shot. And I like challenges. I mean, I'm one of those people who I want to see how far I can take something and I want to see how I can do it. And if I can do it, like pushing myself and putting obstacles that I need to overcome. So I think that helps in growth and character. And um, so, yeah. So and then when I started, uh, it was just like a medan. So I'd mm. registered it because I don't believe in doing anything without it being legal. Yeah. And I don't take money or I wouldn't do any of that without legally having everything in place. So we are Quite a right. very, mashallah, say a good registered, audited, yeah. very, you know, like a yeah. solid organization. Yeah. So I and did all of that. I didn't even know about like, that stuff. Yeah. Even from like the website and you can see how organized all your functions are and there's, you know, you, you know where to donate, you know what to do, all these questions have been answered and I think that that really kind of methodical and really sort of step-by-step -step approach, it really shows in how professional you know, it is the work that you guys are doing. Like, it's done in such a professional way. And I think that probably has made all the difference as well because it is a serious enterprise and it is serious work that's being done. And I want to kind of cycle back to what you said about suffering because I think that that is so important. But just before we do that, hi, Hina. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, yes, I can hear you, Madam. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. So, Hina, now I want you to tell me a little bit about your journey. And I'm very uh, curious about Faltu Sepaltu because from what I understand, the idea was actually part of your art and design master's thesis. And that in itself is just really cool, actually, because you took your love for animals and the, and the sort of rescue work that you've been doing over the past several years. And then you've sort of melded that with your academic interests and you've come up with this wonderful project that is furthering the cause. So tell me a little bit about your story. Okay, Mina, so mine is pretty different from Aisha. I yeah. started off when I was hardly 18 or 17 years old. Yeah. So it started, you know, I would bring animals home. From one cat to another, I would put animals in my backpack and I would sneak them inside and put them in the bathroom and stuff. And over the years, you know, <laughs> as I got my separate space, yeah. you know, I would bring them in. And I nahi, nahi, nahi hai, koi aata. Um, even if someone would come up, you know, I would say, so, no, it's just one cat, two cat. But that started off and over the and years. And behind the started, door, there would be like 10. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, even to this point my parents do not know what exact number do I have I, I try not to show them these interviews and articles because you know they are do I do them okay. however you know it, over the years I've been rescuing on a very personal level like how whatever I can do in whatever capacity I can I bring the animal and rehabilitate try to put them in a home but it's mm -hmm. been very recent that when I started my master's program I realized that you know over the years it's the same cycle that kept on repeating itself you know mm -hmm. you always mm -hmm. get a call that an animal has been abused an animal is about to be culled that is abandoned in whatsoever way yeah. so that was thing that that was the thing that was bothering me that as one person even if we have like a hundred organizations here we will not be able to address the issue until unless we start working on the grassroots so right. Paldo is about is basically an initiative hmm. to work on that. So, you know, all these cases that are being reported, all these um, cullings that are happening, mm. abuse mm. and all, all sorts of abuses are happening. Yeah. It is happening in the city. It is, it is happening on field. So my yeah. purpose of bringing up this project was to go back there and have a conversation with those people. You know, no yeah. one is doing that. On, maybe some people might be doing it purposely. But mm. then again, the idea is about negligence. You know, there there's yeah. a lot of empathy there. And empathy, mm. I think, is also a learned behavior like empathy. And you can reverse yeah. that. So the entire idea about Faldo Se Faldo is to go back into the city, speak to those people, you know, in engage them in creative manner, bring them tools and, you know, put them on board with them. Like, yeah. Talk to them as equals. Not We're not there to, you know, give them a lecture or something yes, like that. We work with right. them. We work with the children especially. That, yeah. That's the whole point, you know, because that, that's the only hope that we have. With adults, you have a lot of levels that you cannot reason on. And you, mm. They bring on mm. religious perspective and social and stuff. But with children, you know, they're very raw. And I believe that if yeah. we have children taking care of this, and most of the cases of abuse that happens are at the hands of children. That's so mm. terrifying. 
That I is remember, actually, you know, that's very scary. I think that that's a really important point as well, because when we're dealing with adults, there are a lot of different issues that come into play, trying to have a conversation about being humane to the animals that they own. But children don't necessarily have those same concerns. Like they don't have to sort of worry about, um, you know, looking after the donkey that pulls the cart that their father runs their business from, for example. But at the same time, it's really important to realize that a lot of uh, animal abuse that's happening with strays, for example, a lot of times children are the ones perpetrating that abuse. And that's actually really scary. And that's something that we will talk about later on in the show. But I want to come back to the idea of, well, not the idea, the, the reality. And maybe Aisha, you can weigh in on this. Uh, with me first, because I know that ACF does a lot of donkey rescue and donkey welfare work. And the fact is that because Pakistan is, you know, an agrarian economy and it's an agriculture based economy. So then obviously horses and donkeys and goats form the mainstay of a lot of agricultural practices and we need them. And I think that's probably where this idea of animals as property comes from. And I know that ACF has been, you know, um, trying to work with people who do own these animals for the, and use them for business and, and whatever work that they do to kind of, it's, it's a delicate conversation to have, I imagine, because you can't take someone's property from them. But at the same time, it's also kind of counterintuitive that if the only animal you have to pull your cart is an animal that you're treating horribly, then that animal is not going to make it. And then who's going to pull your cart? You know, it's a sort of long-term approach as well. So, uh, and picking up from what Hina said and huh. sort of, you know, connecting it, what you're talking about right now, um, for me, the reason I say it's the very philosophical sort of uh, an ideology hmm. that I'm following, because as a therapist, um, this animal rescue has yeah. taught me, because we've rescued, rescued now over 9,000 animals easily. Yeah. And in like the, what, the last eight years, so we've seen all sorts of abuse. We've mm -hmm. seen all sorts of people. We've met all sorts of people. Um, I've spoken to like thousands just myself. And this is not counting our outreach programs where, yeah. uh, you know, we, which I'll get to in a moment. But what's really interesting is that as a therapist, you yeah. get to see the best of people and the worst of people. Oh. And you really try to, you, you understand a lot of human behavior huh. and why it's the case because uh, the issue of animal abuse is far greater than animals. It's actually a reflection. It's like holding up a mirror to our society and our culture and mm. seeing what it is that we are doing. Yep. So, uh, and, and so, you know, that's the part where I was like, whoa, this is why I like focus just on animals. Yeah. I didn't do the extra stuff that I wanted to do. Yeah. I sort of melded it all together. And yeah. for me, it was more um, the way we educate. So we've always been about empathy and compassion. Like that's my standard that I'm not going to do anything unless the education comes in mm -hmm. at the same time. So I'm really glad Hena started this in Lahore because it's so interesting to go out there. So we go out, we vaccinate, we neuter our dogs, we talk to people in the area. So we have to, we have to have one-on-one -on -one interactions yeah. to understand why this is happening, how they think. Mm. And if we don't exercise the same empathy towards them, even if yeah. they are not our kind of people or that, mm. you know, they're horrible to animals, if you don't yes. give them that respect, then they're never going to get it. So right. like, and the, the, the donkey medical camps that we have, so we were also doing them in Islamabad as well, but because mm. like legally now we have to register in Islamabad and also we had to stop them temporarily, but we were working in the brick kiln Mm -hmm. where they're bonded slave labor till now and their only source of you know making money is mm. the donkey and we're, we're working with donkeys in Karachi so uh, you know we always tell the donkey owner ki, you have to bring your son or your daughter whoever's going to take over your karobar with you mm. to our camps because as 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 Hina was saying so what I realized like a while back was that the donkey owner might not get it but his son is going to get it really so if we mm. just yeah, Why because do you, think you said, is? this is what I mean. Huh. This all stems back to our children are much more flexible and, and malleable hmm. to make them. And, and you have to show it yourself. So, like, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yesterday when I was at Empress Market over here, which is like your uh, your to to tolling to market. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the same as that, right? Yeah. So we were, but we, we, uh, I don't believe in going and screaming and yelling and yes. doing all of that. It doesn't work. It makes no. us feel good mm -hmm. that we are these saviors and we have this God complex that we're so great. Yeah. The 
person is going to actually double the abuse they're doing be it on the donkey on the dog mm. on the animals so they get defensive as well like yeah. garbage of course yeah. and that's no way of getting um, ahead with anyone even if But, someone did that to me i'd be like what the hell are you i probably yeah. want to do more yeah. uh, you know so you got to sort of change that around which is why i think being a therapist helps because i've trained my team in therapy when it comes to engaging with people talking yeah. to yeah. people so yesterday for example we um i sat on the floor on one of the uh, at one of the shops in empress market mm-hmm. where the cats hadn't been like there were these beautiful persian cats who hadn't been <gasps> fed in like that. three days i saw yeah, that and, and was, they were just no half, food or water they were just just they were lying the, there <gasps> and so these uh, empress market people thought i was some you know fancy person who's come mm-hmm. in and i'm just going to mm-hmm. raid their place and i'm yeah. with police i'm going to do that no what i did was i sat on the ground i said open up the cats let me sit with them i'm going to feed them and when the owner of the shop saw that he was like you know i didn't think a woman like you would ever sit on the ground like i've never seen this happen he yeah. was like just take all of them just just really take them. he just yeah, gave them so to you like, Okay yeah because we're like I've never seen anyone care like that yeah. I've never seen this I don't know what this is and you see the reason I say we're holding up a mirror to our society is because we are so devoid of what empathy is I mean the first rule is the difference between empathy and sympathy yes, and they're two very right. different things yeah yeah and we've I want to I want to ha empathy. and I want to interrupt you here we have to take a break but this is something that I want to really dive into after this break stay with us Welcome back to the coffee table. We're having such a wonderful, brilliant conversation with Aisha Chundigar, who is the founder of ACF Animal Rescue, and Hina Muzaffar Shah, who is the founder of Faltu Se Paltu and also runs a shelter in Lahore. And before the break, we were talking about empathy and sympathy, and how talking about animal rights is so important because most animal abuse is happening at the hands of people who are also deeply traumatized in in different ways and. when we talk about empathy and and being humane to another living creature we're also actually really looking at ourselves and how we interact with other living things and and a lot of a lot of animal abuse comes from being desensitized to your own feelings yourself and and not being able to communicate those feelings in a healthy way and aisha i think that this is where your training as a therapist is also so useful to this conversation because clearly if a child is cutting off a stray's ears it, this is something much deeper and much more serious than just sort of it's not children playing to do something like that you see it's actually really interesting um it's it's funny you say me as a therapist because even for me i was just thinking I did journalism which actually yeah. helps in the writing and because social media is my business model social media yeah. is how the awareness started I had like 20 followers when I started and now we have like a good following right and it was because I kept writing from the point of view of the animal and I kept talking and trying to give a different perspective making videos doing that so that masters came in handy and then my therapy degree came in handy yeah because nothing is wasted if you're not <laughs> nothing is wasted and then my first degree was literature and philosophy so you know and that was the philosophical part yeah. came in oh no me i love that so it's 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 really interesting how i you know sort of combined it all together and it it kind of it honestly it happened itself i didn't plan any of this it sort of just fell into like it just yeah. kept happening yeah. but um yeah so as far as so let me just explain one thing about empathy huh. and sympathy yes. right sympathy is when you can feel bad for someone from a distance and feel like oh that's really sad yeah and it finishes that empathy is when you can put one of your feet in in the other person's shoes and one in your own shoe hmm. and walk together because you're still yourself but you can feel you can feel what it's like to be in the skin of another person hmm. so you feel their feelings very deeply now the biggest thing is it's it's very hard to feel empathy for others if you don't actually 
feel it for yourself or you've never been taught it either. So yeah. now we're saying it's also learned, right? Mm. It's done through behavior. So if mm. the general behavior we see towards a street dog is shoe or stamping your foot or, you know, just throwing yeah. rocks, if mm. that's all that children are going to see, obviously they're going to model that same behavior as yes. they grow up. So. Wow. And, and 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 the thing is, we have become very immune to suffering over here because mm-hmm. there is so much of it, mm-hmm. and 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 that's why it's you know it's it's the animal abuse has become so bad mm-hmm. because people see it more now as a sport because it's it's mm-hmm. it's, it's not about the trauma like I think they've gone beyond. Really? Now it's uh. more about just being, yeah, I think it's more about being sadistic because you can be. It's more mm-hmm. of a power game. It's mm-hmm. when you feel powerless, yeah. you take it out on the most powerless. So you are mm-hmm. projecting your own feelings of powerlessness yeah. Yeah. onto the most weak. Mm-hmm. So that is what's actually going on right now, which, yeah. which is why, I mean, for example, the FBI, you know, like all these big organizations abroad, they look at people who abuse animals as the ones who who grow up or who yeah. escalate to uh, child sexual abuse, physical mm-hmm. abuse, mm-hmm. domestic violence, wife yeah. beaters. Now tell me, we have so much intolerance in our society for so many things. Yeah. There's such a massive divide between women and men, all of this. And yeah. what people, what I at least realized as a therapist doing all of this work, studying and talking to thousands of people by now, mm-hmm. is... Um, that this is all coming from a very uh, deep level of not of not not respecting those who are weaker than you. Quite and right. the easiest way to exercise and to learn that mm. is to learn not to love animals. I'm not asking anyone to love animals. Yeah. I'm asking them just to respect animals. Huh. So for me, this is what I was saying. So, you know, like I'm not expecting people to start adopting strays or yeah. I'm not expecting people because it's it's a very new concept that sort of started taking uh, it, it started like eight years ago when ACF started kind of a thing right yeah. people are talking now about all of this and so eight years is nothing in a in a revolution kind of a thing it's nothing it's a very small drop in the ocean it takes a very long time you've got to take baby steps and so the fact that we're on the show and we can talk about it the fact that you know there are people who are supporting us the fact that we still exist these are the the, these are the small victories like the fact that the government is with me to go to empress market the fact that that's huge all of these it's massive and and it was it it wasn't my idea. It was the assistant commissioner's idea. Wow. So but this she is what sort I'm of saying. Yeah. came to you with it. And that's wonderful. Yes, yes. And the more and we kind I of talk, it, and, and I think that, sorry to interrupt. Also, I feel like, and Hina also mentioned this, that ACF also gets a lot of calls from people who want to kind of report that, you know, there's a, there's a cat that's had kittens on my street or that there's, you know, an animal that's been hit by a car. And, and it's not like people aren't aware, but it's also like, I think, previously where there was just no option, like who could you call maybe 10 years ago? Who could you call if you saw a cat being, you know, a cat hit by a, a car on the side of the road or somebody beating their donkey or there's like a lame horse somewhere? But now there are options. And, and Hina, I think that you also wanted to to weigh in on the empathy and sympathy um, conversation. So, you know, uh, what Aisha has said is so on point. Matlab, you know, it's, yeah. it's so fun to see how some, someone you've never spoken to is coming on the same lines as you have thought and <laughs> not even spoken about. So, when yeah. you started Community. off with, <laughs> You know, when uh, we started off with Faltu Zivaltu, I went to this uh, Aleph Lela Book Work Society. So yeah. basically, they work with uh, different yeah. communities in Lahore. And you know, when I went there, I asked this one question. I asked, what's the difference between a dog and a potato? Okay? And this a dog and a potato? None. What? Yes, and they said there is none. They There's said, no difference said, no. between yes. a dog, which is a living creature with feelings and responses to everything, exactly. and a potato? Yes. They wow. said no. And then I said, okay, can a dog cry? They were like, no. Yeah, can a dog be happy? They said no. And these are the children mostly who have this encounter with stray dogs when, you know, they're on roads going on school. So mm. either they're bitten by the dog or the dog is hurt through them. And that, or that somebody is, is just or off. somebody's just like hooshing them away all the time, which is like what Aisha exactly. said. And then you stamp your foot and you make them run away. So this is, even if the dog is just like sitting on, you know, on the side of the road minding its own business, so we're still very nervous all, all the time. You know, 
the idea of dog is very monstrous for them you know when i was i was i, yeah. brought, I took in a dog of my own and i actually introduced them to children so the parents there actually were telling them no no get away look he has nails he has these claws mm. and stuff and i said you also has nails so he has it for his own purpose it's not there to you know hurt you and all so that's from where we started off and you know uh, the idea that once you have to teach them to feel for the animal as well mm. here i brought in creative tools such as you know drama and theater and play and you know we would tell stories again and again then they would enact those stories and that's yeah. how the sort of when the workshop ended i remember you we were getting out of the bus and there was a dog sitting and one of the children one of the children said that he might bite and all the rest 20 said no he will not if you do not ah. say anything so you know that's you know, eventually they start they start learning this if you keep on revising it we don't we do not mm. even have this you know narrative in our maybe in our curriculum or daily lives and all where there's an mm. idea of a dog it's more like an insult even for any animal it's like mm. we do not see them let alone as equals we don't we don't even see them as a part of the society where we see yeah. them okay they're just an extra that we see them like pest like or any animal for that yeah. matter I think and that, that, that has mm. a lot to do Mm. that has a lot to do with the argument that you first said that uh, we being in a gradient society yeah. so i went to jail uh, to actually you know interview jail. a few mm. Yes, yeah, so for my paper, I went to the jail, uh, Lahore jail. I, I wanted to interview people who had yeah. been inside uh, for murdering people, and I mm. asked that, uh, "Do you have you had any interaction with animals?" And they said, yeah. "Yes, we had had cows and goats and stuff." Yeah. And that was only interaction they had. And then they would say, "Okay, whenever I would ask them, what do you think that there's a difference between animal and a human?" And they said that animals are dumb. I mean, you know, those dumb. farm animals. And this idea, that have, and this idea that animals don't feel. And like when you know, in the first one, where Aisha also talked about the donkeys, and and you know, we're we're often told that well, they don't feel pain, and that they're used to pulling heavy loads, or that while well, you know, they're just sort of these dumb creatures that are just there. Like you know, this idea like a dog and a potato is the same thing. Like they're not. And animals are also. You know, the animals can get depressed. Animals are scared. Animals can get anxious. Animals get nervous. Animals can be happy. Animals love, and these are all things that humans do too. And like all living creatures, on on some level, they're all sort of we we share all of these things. And it's, but I can also see like again, I'm not coming from a place of judgment either. But I can understand that. Do you feel like this is also a part of coming from an agricultural sort of culture, where because the it's like you know the beast of burden is is so crucial to your work that you can't even you're not you can't see them as as um, you know um, sentient or feeling creatures because if you started doing that then you wouldn't be able to work properly. Uh, Aisha, I think you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, I did. I was going to <clears throat> tell you the. Uh, this is my theory, huh. but uh, I think it's a it's a fairly legitimate one. But uh, the reason why we, the people that Hina was talking about, that they can't see the difference between a potato mm -hmm. and an animal. Is because I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little psychological over here, but yeah. it's because uh, we, if you look at humans, yeah. right, we can identify with human suffering, even yeah. if we don't empathize with mm. it, we can identify with yeah. it. Like we what does identify it. mean? Yeah, and the the way we understand human suffering is that oh, that could happen to us because oh. they look like us. Hmm. Do you get it? Yeah. So it's a lot easier to connect with human suffering because there's always that that fear at the back of your mind. Hmm. This could happen to me or someone uh, I love. Uh. So. It's, so and because they look like you so it's yeah. easy to identify and this is human nature yeah. right it's survival of the fittest so if you look right. at survival of the fittest you're going to save those that look like you what hina and i are actually doing is going against the grain of survival yeah. of the fittest to, which is why it's such an uphill battle yes. but so the so the difference over there is you can't identify with a dog because mm -hmm. or with you you will never be locked in a cage so why identify with an animal that is locked in a cage? Yeah. But you could be raped. So you'll, mm. you'll identify with a woman mm. or a child, mm. but you'll never be hit by stones. Yeah. You'll never be locked in a cage. So why should I feel for that? Huh. So again, this is, why, this is what I mean by a very deep level of lack of empathy at all. Mm. Because, and because also for humans, we're not empathic towards humans. The average yeah. person identifies with humans mm. because of the fear mm. that it could happen to us 
Huh. There's a very big difference over there. I'm not saying it in a bad way. It's normal. Even for me, it can somewhat, it's, it's, it's the same, right? I've also had to really challenge my own beliefs and way of being and just see, okay, what is actually going on? What are my projections that I'm mm-hmm. putting out there? Mm-hmm. What are not? Mm-hmm. So with animals, I know I'll never be locked in a cage. Yes. The way a cat is at this market or a yeah. bear is at the zoo, right? Mm-hmm. I know I'm never going to be made to jump through hoops of fire yeah. the way, a, you know, a lion is at a circus. Mm. So why should I identify with that when I can ad- identify with my own? Which is the root of the typical question, why are you helping people and not animals? The yes. reason that comes I was out, going to come this to is that. The reason. <laughs> yeah. This is the so reason. This is, yeah. this, this is the reason why. That question is asked so often. So once I understood the answer to the question, which is this, what I just told you, Hmm. I was like, this is really interesting, which is why the education element that now that that comes in, like we get acid burn survivors to come to our sanctuary. This is before Corona. But, you know, now we're still having a few people come by. We have these drug addicted kids who are now in recovery, who've been Hmm. through intense abuse. They come by. And you know, all, to those, all, of all those well. statistics, and there are so many these about how people, for example, an acid burn survivor or children who have survived trauma, animals help them recover. Animals help their recovery. People who own pets scientifically have lower blood pressure and lower and less depression and less anxiety than people who don't have pets. So clearly there is a very deep connection between humans being empathetic and being kind and being able to look after the most sort of helpless creature around them, which are animals. And animals, you know, they can't, um, there's, it, there's no material gain to be had from looking after a dog or a cat or a donkey, except just sort of doing something which is, oh, which is good. Identify. You know? Oh, sorry. I think we're talking over each other. <laughs> no, it's okay. My bad. No, no, it's fine. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm sort it's, of ruminating. No, <laughs> Uh, people, so when these kids come, for example, right, mm-hmm. and they've been through their own trauma and they see a dog who is on a wheelchair, who's really happy and, yeah. you know, because my sanctuary, I don't believe in a mis- like misery, like I don't, it, it, even abroad, a lot of shelters, I don't call mine a shelter, I call it a sanctuary uh-huh. yeah. because I don't believe in cages. I, yeah. Cages are for sick animals, even then I have quarantine rooms. Mm-hmm. So I made it a point mm-hmm. to make enough money to do whatever I could to do as, uh, do it right or not do it at all. Yeah. So that's how I think. It's either excellent or it's nothing. Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't put my name on it. Yeah. So we are actually that level. Like, I'm very proud of my team. It's not me. It's my team. They are next level phenomenal that they can bring animals back from the brink of death. And yeah. it's incredible, my my team. Like, they're just amazing. It really so, yeah, and, and the sanctuary has this very healing uh, feeling about it huh. because all the animals are open. It's a very beautiful place. So you have this dog on a wheelchair or a three-legged dog or a blind cat or whatever, but they're all so happy. Yeah. So, you know, when these kids come or people come and they see that, wow, you know, you see this dog who has three legs or no legs, but he runs as fast as a four-legged dog because yeah. he doesn't see that he's lesser than Huh. With humans, we have so many complicated emotions, insecurities, fears. We're either living in the past or the future. We're never living in the present. Yeah. Animals live in the present. Yeah. So a three-legged dog is not going to care and not even register that he has three legs because do- animals don't register the way humans do. But he will run faster than a four-legged dog. See, see. So when these kids um. see that, they're just like, whoa, he doesn't think there's anything wrong with him, but he has three legs. So I'm like, yeah, yeah so if you look at yourself, why do you feel not good enough when the three-legged dog doesn't feel good enough? Like the the three-legged dog, he's like, he's as good. These kids are like, yeah, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense. I hate to interrupt this wonderful conversation, but needs must. We're going to take a very quick break and we'll be back in a flash. Stay with us. Welcome back to the coffee table and the scintillating, fabulous conversation that we're having with Aisha Chundrigar from the ACF Animal Sanctuary and Hina Muzaffar Shah from Faltu Sepaltu. And we've been talking all things animals and all things empathy and kindness and how we can make our cities better. And also doing a lot of myth-busting along the way. And it's just been 
Wonderful. Hina, in the videos that I saw that you were making for Faltu Se Paltu, there is a video of you interacting with kids from a Kachi Abadi in the middle of a lot of trash. And they've, they've got these stray dogs that are their pets and they all have names and all the kids are giving them cuddles and they all know whose personality is like what. And it really seems like, you know, they're all friends. And all of these kiddos have this personal relationship with these stray dogs. And it's just so wonderful wonderful to see. Yes, but no, so you know when I actually went out there and I started interacting, apparently my uh, first, you know, the idea that I had, I thought these children, are, these are the ones who are going to beat them and stuff. And mm. But it completely changed. When I actually went there, you know, we just those dogs were in fact protective of those children. Mm. So we went there. When the children started interacting with it, that's only when the dogs came in as well. That's yeah. when they started trusting us. And mm. you know, it's just like I feel as if for children, it's way easier to understand the other animal because they do not have all these pre-learned behaviors that we have now. Yeah. Yeah. That okay, this is an animal. Yet this has to be at a distance or any. And with those children, you know, they did not have this typical hygiene issue mm -hmm. that we bring in every time. So they were <laughs> yeah, because those are all those sort of things that we. No, and I'm also thinking about these kids because we've been talking about how empathy is a learned behavior and how children are not naturally unempathetic, but if they're looking at behaviors around them and those are the things they're learning. So the the sort of it can go here or it could go there. You know, it's a sort of it could go any, either in either direction but as long as we sort of keep trying to kind of push them towards the empathetic side then there is hope for you know us to be able to be kinder to our environment as well around us and and Hina I think you wrote a I think I know that you wrote a really great article about how the ecosystem of a city, of an urban space, does include animals. And we do have stray dogs in cities. We have stray cats. We have, um, you know, maybe other cities have different kinds of things. Like I know that Islamabad used to have a lot of wild boars at some point. But each, all cities have animals in them. So, and this is where my mind is now turning to culling. And, and you know, this whole idea that we need to cull strays to control rabies. But it's not even true. Um, it's not true that all strays will give you rabies, for example. OK, let me just go like uh, yeah, go but a first to the city. So, you know, <laughs> Yes. Okay. So it's the city. Um, I think I should start pehle se where I wanted to. <laughs> so with the animals, with the children, those animals. The difference is that those children have grown up with those animals, right. those dogs. You know, mm -hmm. they have not. They're not looking them as we have them as pets. Similarly, right. if you move to our village side and all there, you see a lot of dog population there. However, they're protecting those farms. They're protecting that livestock. So here also, those animals are not kept as pets, but they're mm -hmm. just living around and they're playing their role. What has happened right. in the city? The way we have grown as urban spaces we actually mm -hmm. we have actually invaded their area and we're trying to push them out and that's typically technically that's impossible you know because the ecosystem doesn't work that way we have right. a lot of by we have a lot of organic waste and we need those dogs for us otherwise mm. you know you, you'll die of plague or something like that i think that's and something also, that a lot of people don't consider is that there is an actual function that a lot of stray animals perform living in a city they're not just aimlessly wandering around trying to jump on you or you know, run after your car they're also doing things like you know eating up ex excess food waste for example i think that's and that's they, really they interesting should be there they should, should be, be there, there. For that. Mm. Mm. And mm. also, if you try to eliminate them through these unnatural ways of culling and all, as mm. uh, Aisha has also mentioned in quite a few articles, that you know this is this is actually law of nature, the survival the survival thing that they start reproducing more. So if you oh. kill about like ten dogs, there'll be fifty more in the same area soon. And if you remove those dogs that are actually taking ta living in that area, there'll be other dogs encroaching the same area soon. Mm. So it's mm. a cycle that will go on until you address it in a systematic way, and that that yes. option is only spay and neuter. Right. So, you know, you have to see that how these animals could mm. be put to greater use for themselves and for ourselves as well. Because Quite we right. actually do need them. So, Aisha, tell me a little bit more about the TNR uh, approach to controlling stray populations. So, that's trap, neuter and return. Okay, so uh, more like T and VR because okay. it's trap, neuter, vaccinate ah, and release, please. right? 
So uh, Hina sort of mentioned that right now as to, you know, about the population will grow more if you keep culling them. Because mm -hmm. again, it's a survival of the fittest instinct that animals have as well, that when any species knows that they're under threat, mm -hmm. they are going to mate more to make sure their species does not die out. That's right. just a given of nature mm. that none of mm. us can really do anything about. And um, so we, we started like an entire big program, which we were small and I kept building it up as it kept going on mm. in the last maybe two, three years of trying to, yeah. uh, you know, make this something. And it, um, it's, it's, it, it's really wonderful because people... Uh, call us and like as you were saying we get as as far as rescues cues go we get about 300 messages a day for any sort of thing for help with their wow. pet or to rescue this animal yeah it's mm. our social media is insane and that doesn't even count our hotline number but then we also get um our uh, we we get so many calls from across not just mm. Karachi, but mm. Hyderabad, or Islamabad, mm. please come here, please come here. Dogs are being poisoned, dogs are being killed. Can you just come? And so, so a lot of people say, just take the dogs away. So I was like, look, you can take the dogs away, but you'll have 10 more who, who, who are going to uh, come over here. Just so so let's along. vaccinate. Mm. Yeah, so if you vaccinate new to them, right, and put collars on them, you just leave out leftovers. No one is saying to feed them, you know, because yeah. then the whole thing comes in. I prefer to feed people. I'm like, feed people. I'm not asking uh, you to, but uh. people are not going to eat bones. People are not going to eat, like, you know, stale pieces of roti or bread. Yes. So yes. you can actually give that yeah. to put that in a mitti ka piala, keep it mm. outside, keep mm. some cold water outside. They're actually great guard dogs. And you just you just keep them li like that, and mm. if you keep hitting them and you keep doing horrible things to them, yeah, you know, then how do you? If someone did that to me, if I was asleep and someone kept throwing rocks at me huh. or shooing me away or stamping their foot, I would go destroy that per that person yeah. in a second. <laughs> how can you expect a dog not to not to retaliate? Exactly, because the dog it's doesn't. The same cause and, and effect. It's the same thing, and yeah. then the biggest thing is that what people don't get the the what 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 I found really interesting in talking to yeah. people is that people think dogs know and have planned out who they are going to bite. Like they're actually projecting their own way of being onto a dog. Yeah. That no, well, he maybe he was hit by some other guy, but he's bitten this child over here. So then he he should have just bitten that guy. So yeah, well, you see, that is huh. such a complicated concept to make people understand yeah. Yeah. that animals don't, they, they can't think, they feel everything we feel, but they don't, they're, they're not mm. able to think or, yeah. you know, understand, okay, this one is the bad guy and this one is the good guy. So only yeah. by that one and not this one. When you are living on the street as mm. an animal, yeah, it's, you are literally surviving yeah. and you are surviving and you're thinking every human is bad. So yes, you are because that's all anything. you've experienced. And every, so if we are if we are just generally kinder to strays, then strays won't have a reason to mistrust us. And actually, that just kind of makes logical sense as well. So Aisha, I am curious though because I think a lot of people, when it comes to biting, and that's the sort of main reason why people support culling. Uh, and there's this idea that all strays will have rabies. And that all dogs that bite you, all stray dogs that bite you, will give you rabies. So that's not true, is it? I mean, honestly, I've I've been around maybe ten thousand dogs so right. far, stray dogs, yeah, yeah. in eight years. Do you know I've never met a dog with rabies ever, ever. Right. Rabies. When you ask the average person, do you know what rabies is? They'll be like, no. So what is rabies? People don't know the difference between a dog bite and a rabies and, and a rabbit bite. Rabies is something where the, do, the dogs, okay, so rabies is often in bats and bats are ah. more in rural areas. So right. dogs in rural areas or any animal in a rural area can get bitten by a bat who ah. are rabies carriers and then they will get rabies and oh. then that animal will foam right. at the mouth. They can't go out in the sun. They can't see the, the day. So they'll hide in dark places. They'll bite anything and everything inside. Their eyes are red because it's, it's, wow. it's a brain disorder. Right? Yes. You're, you you basically go mad and you die uh -huh. within 10 days of getting the disease. Mm -hmm. So if there's a dog who's sleeping, chilling in the sun, yeah. right, on any footpath or, or, or whatever, and you're saying he has rabies, it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, he's like, not the dog rabies. is chilling out. Yeah. <laughs> no, so this so, is very so important. No yeah, this is really it's important, important because to kind of recognize. We, we actually connected rabies to stray dogs dogs many 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 moons ago and we've stuck to it not mm -hmm. realizing it's actually a myth and it's not reality 
you maybe find the odd which i still to date have not met a arab at dog right. so there's number one a very big difference between yeah. a, 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 a rabies a rabbit dog mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. a regular street dog mm-hmm. and that is i think the first difference that people need to understand yeah. and second one is that a dog doesn't realize who they are biting they are just trying to survive it's an and it's even an the most uh, it's an animal instinct it's then. an instinct mm. yeah mm. yeah absolutely and the moment you become slightly nicer and I, again don't i'm not saying love them no one has yeah. to be an animal lover i'm not yeah. pushing that on anyone to be that i hate doing that nor do I, hence i don't ask people to adopt if they want to if they see my work if they see what i do and then they want to come yeah. forward which many have then i'll be like okay but i don't believe in preaching and throwing new right, ideas right. and just and yeah, then getting mad at people for not yeah. accepting and some people just aren't that into animals but i think that what you and hina are are basically talking about is being it's just empathy and even maybe just being neutral to animals we don't have to harm them and you do you don't have to put them on your lap either but you can be neutral about animals as well and and that's a sort of it sounds so silly and simple also to just not harm don't don't sort of actively go out and harm a, an animal so hina do you have any other tips for us in terms of even if you're nervous about an animal and you know like Aisha said about how you can put some water in a bowl outside or you can leave scraps outside that a stray dog could come and eat um is there anything else that we can do or sort of uh, you know conversations to have with the younger people in our life or even people you know when you're sort of on the road and you see somebody like mistreating their donkey for example so with a is there are there some ways that we can kind of approach this conversation in a way that is healthy or productive and without ruffling their feathers but also trying to kind of communicate that this is this is not okay mentioned this earlier as well that not just go out screaming at at those people right. that no you cannot do this you're doing because you know when you will come in a defensive position for them so will they yeah. so what i have learned through all my experience i i i used to be the one you know i, I remember when i was younger i would literally start fighting on the road yeah. <laughs> then i realized that it's not productive at all yeah. so you have to you know um, the I think it it's going to vary vary from people to people if you see a child doing so you'll have to talk to them into manner yeah. if someone does that to you how would you feel okay so if you see a donkey owner sort of doing this and what mostly I do I I reach to them from the islamic perspective and I say that look it's it is not kind your religion yeah. doesn't preach yeah. so yeah. and you know yeah. if someone who is very so that's a good way to kind of approach that uh, yes you have to shift well. you have to shift your narrative i think yeah. as per the area mm. you know when we would even mm. work in the jogi wala areas and stuff mm. for uh, for the children we would tell them that how these children uh, have these dogs you know they're loving you and stuff for the people we would tell them they're protecting you actually yeah well thank you so much aisha and thank you so much hina for being with me and i think this is a conversation that we could i could just keep having for hours and hours <laughs> but unfortunately we have to save something for next time thank you guys for watching i hope that this you have learned as much from these two wonderful women and in this wonderful conversation as i have um if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to like and subscribe also please look up the acf sanctuary and faltu sepaltu on instagram i'm not sure if they have a facebook page because i haven't checked but they're definitely on instagram they are always open for donations for volunteers for any kind of help that you can give share their work spread the word and again like you know everything everything counts nothing is wasted and working towards a kinder and more empathetic city and and heart for all of us what could be better than that thank you guys for watching again if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you next time on the coffee table bye